Today we're going to do deep dives on five players, hopefully, time permitting. Uh, we're going to go through four relievers and then a utility player. And then at the end of the show, we're going to discuss the new baseball league, Baseball United, all today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, October 30th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, Okay, welcome back, everybody. Hope that you had a fantastic weekend, Halloween weekend. Uh, Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, by the way. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winnings $5 money line bet. That's $150. If your team wins, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Um, Okay, we're going to do some deep dives today. We're going to start off with some news and notes. There's really nothing groundbreaking or earth shattering coming out of Tigers camp at the time being, but uh, a couple of things that I want to point out, and then we're going to try to get through five players, time permitting. I think we'll be good. Uh, The reason why we're clumping these guys together, A, four of them are relievers, so that's just kind of easy. We can knock out a lot of the bullpen here, Uh, but I don't think any of these guys, even with like deep dives, quote unquote, are you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 minute long conversations in their own. Uh, And I think that the reason why we're even doing these deep dives is to have the discussion about what to do with these players this winter, right? And like their performance and their numbers and the analytics in 2023 are just setting up the decision on what to do with them in 2024. So if the decision is fairly straightforward about what to do in 2024 or what to do this winter rather, with them, uh, or if it's just not a very difficult conversation, then that limits the you know length of conversation in the deep dive. So we're going to try to get through these five again, knock out. I want to get through everybody on the major league roster at least, or you know as many people on the forty man as we can, uh, because I do think it's important to make it known. A, my opinion of uh, what to do with these guys this winter, but B, give y'all enough information to where you can come to your own conclusions as well. So I'm going to knock out those five today. Then at the end, we'll talk about Baseball United, the new baseball league that had a draft recently. Um, As far as news and notes go here to start off the show, uh, one is just the World Series is really fun, A. And B, the the end date for the World Series is important for Tigers fans, for baseball fans, uh, because a lot of decisions, a lot of roster decisions, we'll kind of have after the World Series ends, we'll lay out like the offseason schedule. Um, but five days after the world series is when like the first set of decisions are due. Uh, there's some qualifying offer conversations. Um, there's some re-signing, there's some player option stuff, uh, all within the first five days of the world series. So that is important. Something to keep an eye out for there. Uh, also it just, it sounds like Erod is going to opt out. There's more and more, you know, speculation in regards to that. Uh, we've been saying it since February on this show. It's like not really groundbreaking or earth shattering news at this point. I'm fully just expecting him to opt out. Uh, and if he doesn't, that would be the news story. If he does, that's just another day, uh, to me. So, uh, nothing really new there, but more people are, are kind of talking about it. And then I guess the last one, Brad Osmus is in the running apparently for the Houston Astros managerial opening now that Dusty Baker has retired. So, okay, uh, let's move on to some deep dives. All right, let's talk Turkey. Uh, we're going to talk about Andrew Vasquez, Jose Cisnero, Trey Wingenter, Garrett Hill, and Tyler Nevin. Uh, I think we can get through everybody here. Let's start off with Andrew Vasquez. This is a lefty that only throws sliders and doesn't get swings and misses with his slider that he throws. He throws 82% sliders. Just literally, I mean, a one pitch pitcher, 81.8% sliders. uh, And they go about 81 miles an hour. So when you have a breaking ball first lefty that doesn't get swings and misses, that's going to be kind of like, it's weirdly... The breaking ball lefty thing is a is a positive thing, 
But it's a positive thing because of the ability to get swings and misses. And when you can't do that second percentile and whiff rate, then that kind of eliminates that advantage that you have. Um, I mean, this year he in 48 and a third innings pitched at a 1.43 whip. That's very high. A 3.35 ERA on the season, the 3.39 expected ERA. However, most of that was in Philly. After the Phillies let uh, put him on waivers, the Tigers claimed him. Uh, he had like a 2-1 or a 2-2 ERA when he was put on waivers. And everybody was like, oh, why? And like we, again, like that's something we talked about on this show. We were like, ah, he's, his expected stats aren't very good. He's kind of walking some people. I don't really know if uh, if we're getting like the, you know a, a two ERA lefty exactly, and I don't think anyone was really like, oh my goodness, this guy's the closer or anything like that. Um, but in eight and two thirds innings for your Detroit Tigers, he had an eight point three one ERA and a nine point three five walk per nine, which is astronomically high, uh, and that is paired with a nine point three five. K per nine. So when looking at his season as a whole, when you clump together, obviously his Tigers tenure was just flat out not very good. But when you clump together the whole season, I mean, it's still like he he didn't get hit hard, I guess. Like he, he didn't have his hard hit rate and average exit velo is good. Um, but he doesn't get swings and misses. He doesn't get strikeouts. He walks a lot of hitters. He was he really, really struggled in high leverage situations for the Tigers, at least. Uh I just I don't feel like this is a priority for the Tigers. I uh, I don't feel like Vasquez is going to be very high on the priority list. The Tigers are also over. There are more than forty people on the forty man roster right now for the Tigers. Now that's allowed because the cuts don't have to be made until again a couple weeks after the World Series ends. Um, so we have time and we'll have that conversation about like who is likely to go and whatnot when we get closer to that date. But um, I, I mean I just. Quickly off the top of your head, I mean, I think Vasquez is certainly in the running to be one of the players that is trimmed off to to make to trim the roster down to 40 men again. And just when looking at, you know, his expected weighted on base percent on base average. okay, so the ex Woba against like for hitters when he was on the mound in June when he was still on the Phillies, it was really, really good. And then it's just a almost completely linear, just graph trending upwards, getting worse and worse, obviously getting higher and higher means that the hitters are having more and more success in that stat. And then by the end, he was well below league average uh, by the time his season ended. So yeah, you know, ended the season on the injured list as well. Uh, I, I just, I don't think this is going to be a high priority for a, a guy who next year is going to be 31 years old. Didn't really do well in an old English D. And I mean, at best, if everything was to click for him, you'd be getting a low leverage pitch to contact lefty with one pitch. So I think uh, I, you know, respect, like had a really, really good start to the season. He certainly earned a job somewhere in the league. I think that he'll probably get a minor league deal somewhere, wherever he ends up. Heck, that might even be with the Tigers, just a non 40 man roster, you know, uh, just like re-sign quote unquote type of situation where they sign him to Toledo. Don't put him on the 40 and invite him to spring training. That could be a possibility, but as far as making it through the winter on the 40 man, I just don't see it uh, for Vasquez, but we've been surprised before. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let's keep the ball rolling. Let's talk about Jose Cisnero. All right, we'll do that right after I tell y'all about our friends over at FanDuel. There it is. We talked about FanDuel at the beginning of the show. And look, you can score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. 
All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow. Uh, we got a couple of big names left in the deep dive. We're getting close to the end of the road. We've gotten through most of the roster, uh, but we still have Akil Badu and Spencer Torkelson, who are two very, very, uh, two of the biggest, I think, conversations. Not in Torkelson will obviously be here next year, but just talking about his 2023 will be fascinating. And then Badu is one of the biggest question marks going into the winter. So got a couple more. I don't know if those will be tomorrow, but sometime this week we will do the deep dives on those guys. We got a few other players to get through as well. But um, today we're talking about four relievers and a utility man. We're going to go to Jose Cisnero next. Uh, Jose Cisnero in 2023. His age 34 season had a 5-3-1 ERA and 59 and a third innings pitched, a 1.48 whip and 70 strikeouts. That's a 26.2% K rate, which was pretty good, uh, almost top quarter of the league. And then pretty much everything else was unfortunately bottom third or worse in baseball. Uh, he did really, really well. Was it June? I think in the month of June, he didn't allow a single run. Yes. In 10 and two-thirds innings in June, which was tied for the most innings he pitched in a month all season, so it wasn't a sample size thing either, he appeared in 11 games and gave up zero earned runs and only allowed two hits the entire month, uh, uh, only four walks, six base runners, and zero earned runs in a month. That is absolutely phenomenal uh, outside of, well, uh, the first April and May were not bad either. July, 10.24 ERA. August, 10.61 ERA. September, 5.79 ERA. His ERA post-All-Star break was 7.8. And his whip post-All-Star break was 1.66. Um, I'll tell you what, man. I, this guy is... I guess we can start with he's not going to be back next year. That's a foregone conclusion. Uh, it's why it didn't make sense to me why they didn't move him at the deadline. Not that we would have gotten a big return. It might have been some, you know, 25-year-old in single A that never would have made the majors. But holding on to him, uh, you know, like why was Miguel Diaz, who was great, not up in July? And why did we prioritize innings to Jose Cisnero? I could go on about that forever. I did not like how this front office handled Jose Cisnero in 2023 at all. It was actually like one of my bigger pet peeves, which sounds like such a weird thing because like this team, the difference between this team being – you know, a high 70s win team and like a 90 win team was certainly not Jose Cisnero. Uh, but it's just like small stuff like that really bothers me more than like the big mistakes, to be honest with you. So and I made that very clear. If you listen throughout the season, I, I made it very clear that I every time he pitched, I was like, I love the dude, but golly. Um, so that's where I, what I think about his future. That's really all there is to say. He lost velocity this year. Uh, not a ton. He still averaged 96 miles an hour, but but he he did lose a tick in some of the secondary pitches. Also, uh, the cutter and slider for when he was at his peak were just really, really effective pitches. And I think that this year, both of those, just in terms of like shape and efficiency, really took a step back. Uh, the sinker had a 4-3-8 batting average against as well. Just a pitch that used to be such an effective ground ball pitch. Nothing there. The cutter, a 280 batting average against, was, again, such an effective pitch when he was at his best. Just didn't have it this season. Uh, age is probably catching up to him. He's in his mid-30s now. Um, I, well, that's really all there is to say about Cisnero. I just want to make it very clear. This guy is legitimately one of the more underrated Detroit Tigers of the last four years. And I strongly believe that. Strongly. Um he was nothing but an absolute workhorse that also was one of the best relievers on the team, right? Over the last, again, like several seasons, uh, in 2021, he had a 3.65 ERA and over 60 innings pitched. Like, I, I just want to give him his flowers. I know that for the second half of the season, pretty much every time he was on the mound, I was complaining about how he was on the mound, and I just, you know, went on a spiel about how I was frustrated with uh, with how he was handled and that he was still on this team and whatnot. I would have parted ways with him in the heart of the season. Uh, there's no way I, I we would have gotten to the end of the year with him on the roster. But like, I, it, it, he just deserves a lot of credit. Twenty twenty twenty, 
three ERA in almost 30 innings of a 60 game season is remarkable usage. 2021, 365 ERA in over 61 innings pitch. That's again, workhorse, great usage. Last year dealt with some injury stuff, 1.08 ERA in just 25 innings though. And then this year, again, really good in the first half. Like this is for a, and, you know, best Tiger on a, you know, bad Tigers teams is really not saying much. And he certainly, you know, he's a one inning reliever. There's a limit to how much value that brings, I guess. But uh, as far as, as far as bullpen pieces go, I think he was an unsung hero. I've got so many people are just going to let him like slip through the cracks of, of Tigers history just because those teams weren't very good. But uh, I, I think he deserves a ton of credit. So my, my wanting him to, uh, again, like I, I would have parted ways with him three months ago if it was up to me. Uh, but that that does not take away from his Tigers career, which I think is is one of the more underrated of recent memory. Um, he, he was a very important part to the 2020 through 2022 Detroit Tigers. And I think Hinch would tell you the same thing. So uh, tip of the cap, sol- very solid Tigers tenure. And, uh, you know, hopefully he can find a job, whether it's a minor league job or whatnot. Hopefully he can find work this winter, but I don't think it's going to be with the Detroit Tigers. I think his uh, the Jose Cisnero Tigers era is probably over. Uh, let's go to Trey Wingenter, another reliever. This one's a little more fascinating to me. He's 29 years old. Next year, I believe he will be will be his age 30 season. Um, so he, he was... He has good stuff. It's just he I, I really don't think he has any clue where the ball's going. Which, like, we have several of those. Like, he's not alone there. Um, but th- this was a really fascinating get when we got him last season, right? Like last winter. Uh, this was a, a a guy that missed a lot due to injuries, missed a lot of time, right? His gap between major league appearances was four years, 2019 to 2023. Uh, so dealt with a lot of injuries and the Tigers took a chance on him. Uh, the velocity is like not bad. 96 mile an hour fastball, 84 mile an hour slider, perfect 50, 50 usage between those two pitches. Um, I like the fastball has some movement on it, it, it there. I think the pitches are good. The slider had a, had a 179 batting average against this year. Good stuff, right? It's just, I, the command is a huge issue. It's it's a huge issue. Uh, there, there's a lot of sporadic location, I, I guess would be to put it lightly. And his walk rate wasn't terrible. He had a 9.2% walk rate. That's less than league average, but not that much less than league average. Um, and when it's paired with, like he did get swings and misses. He did get strikeouts. He did get chases. I, I, there, there is something here to work with, which is why it's so frustrating that he was so inconsistent with his command. It also just felt like every single high leverage situation uh, he kind of came up on the losing end of. So, and he missed more time this year with an injury, which has like clearly been a big thing throughout his entire career. So I, I think this is probably a guy that you don't prioritize uh, when, when you're figuring out who the 40 people are that you're going to keep on the 40 man roster. Uh, in a couple of weeks, but um, it wouldn't shock me if he was a, we're going to remove you from the 40 man and then give you a minor league deal. I think of all these guys, he is probably the most likely to do that. So uh, something to keep an eye out for a a little bit there, but yeah, I, you know, I, I'm glad we got to see him because I was kind of frustrated that we used him in really high leverage. The first couple of weeks of the season, he was like the closer in, in the third or fourth series of the year. And then that he got we were going to use like has the um so I'm glad we at least got to see him makes it a little bit more straightforward because we actually know we're dealing with we actually saw him on the mound um yeah you know all in all I think I guess he does have an option left so maybe that makes it a little more doable to keep him around. We'll see. I still think that he's not going to be a priority, that he probably doesn't make it through the uh, the winter. But uh, if he was back here in spring training, it would not surprise me at all. Okay. Okay, let's get to the 
the last couple of players here on the docket, we're going to talk about Tyler Nevin and Garrett Hill. Then we're going to spend the end of the show talking about the new baseball league here. We'll do that right after this. All right, everybody, we are back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate y'all for tuning in. Let's talk Garrett Hill. Uh, Garrett Hill this season had a 9-1-9 ERA in 15 and two-thirds innings with a whip over two. The one thing that's important to remember about Garrett Hill is he does have options left. So they could keep him on the roster and send him down to AAA in the spring and wouldn't have to waive him or anything like that, which I think does help him because, I, I mean, honestly, if – he didn't have those options. I would say there's pretty much no chance he would make it through the winter, but I think that at least helps him a little bit. I still would lean like, I don't know. I keep going back and forth in my head. He really struggled this season. Let's talk about him, the pitcher uh, again, uh, ERA over nine and, and 15 and two thirds. He, unfortunately, Garrett Hill just doesn't have swing and miss major league level stuff. Uh, the chase rate was astronomically low. 15.2% is unbelievably low. Uh, that would be like one or zero with percentile. I don't think zero with percentile is a thing. First percentile. Uh, whiff rate, 20.7%. That's really low. K rate, 17.5%. Really, really low. Walk rate, 17.5%. That is unfathomably high. That That's that's preposterous how, how high of a number that is. Uh, he ended with an 8.04 walk per nine, which was also his K per nine. He was by war, the least valuable pitcher on the team with negative 0.5 F war. Um, yeah, man, like he, he just, he doesn't have swing and miss major league stuff. Now, the one thing I will say about Garrett Hill is if you go back to the spring, he was a guy that I was at one point advocating for to be on the major league roster, at least get a look in the majors. And it was because when they last year, he was still believed to be a starter. We talked about him in the winter as like a starter depth. Uh, that ship has sailed. He, he's not going to be a major league starter for the Detroit Tigers. But when they moved him to the bullpen in the spring, he was throwing like a 94 to 96 mile an hour sinker. And I was like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. I'm down for that, right? Like that, that's awesome. Uh, even if you don't have anything else, getting a, a sinker that, you know, like Jason Foley proves that every time he comes out of the pen, you can be a reliever with one pitch and have it be the sinker. And you can, you can manage, baby, right? So I, I was kind of like, oh, like he can be a multi-inning version of, of Jason Foley a little bit. Uh, but but all of the other pitches, the, the four seam fastball, the slider, the changeup got absolutely crushed this year at the major league level. The curveball, like just no other pitch besides the sinker, was really effective. And the sinker even was only effective when it was in the strike zone, which was not very often. Not a single one of his pitches had a strike rate of over twenty percent. That's that's that can't happen. That's astronomically low. So that will continue to be the biggest thing for him is just flat out command. It's it's not a long conversation, which is why he's kind of part of this crew. Uh, again, with multiple option, multiple options left, it wouldn't shock me if he made it through the winter and was just kind of waiting in Toledo again. Um, but uh, until he can consistently throw the ball in the strike zone, uh, his career path is not going to change. So that's going to be the biggest thing for him. Um, I, I do like the sinker uh, again, like this is a, a, a pitch that I saw in spring and I was like, please like put him on my opening day roster, or at least give him a look early. I'm down. Um, and, and then very quickly, I realized that the, the sinker was fine, but he had just no command to go along with it, unfortunately. So we will see what happens with him. Um, it wouldn't shock me either way. If they decided to just cut ties with him and open a roster spot, it wouldn't shock me if he made it through the winter, but was it was expected that he was going to be in Toledo all of next year. It wouldn't shock me either. Okay, let's go to Tyler Nevin to uh, end the deep dives here. Tyler Nevin this season had a 200 batting average, a 306 OBP, a 316 slug for a 622 OPS. Uh, he hit lefties pretty well, which is something that uh, he deserves a ton of credit for. Tyler Nevin, I, I 
for whatever reason, earlier in the year, I mean, before he got sent down the first time, he had an OPS in the 400s. And uh, I, when he got recalled, I was upset. And I was like, this makes no sense. Like, we have other prospects that we want to get a look. And we're calling up a guy that has an OPS in the 400s. And I just want to give him credit because he he did, like in the month of September, he hit 289 with an 874 OPS. Like, I... I, for as much as like, it is obviously my job to come on here and like voice my opinion on these things. And uh, as much as I disagree with that decision to call him up in in September, especially over like some of the prospects that we could have given a look, um, he deserves a ton of credit. And I just want to give him his flowers because he, he hit really, really well in September and, uh, and, you know, just disagree or agree with the decision regardless that's out the window. Um, they called him up and he did well. So credit where credit is due. Good job, Tyler Nevin. Um, and, and like, again, like outside of September, his OPS was in the 400s. Like he, it, it, he is what he is. Uh, he is just a guy who I think velocity really eats him up at the major league level. I think uh, just you can just jam him with fastballs inside and he's going to be late on a lot of pitches, which I think is kind of what puts a ceiling on his value at the major league level. Um, however, he plays multiple positions in the infield and he can draw walks, which is why this front office got him initially last winter and why he was like weirdly one of Scott Harris's first moves. I remember where I was when the, cause we, <laughs> that's funny. We acquired Tyler Nevin while Michigan was losing to TCU in, uh, in the, in the college football playoff last year. So I remember exactly where I was. I was trying to, I was heartbroken over a football game. The next thing you know, I'm, I'm getting a notification that we acquired Tyler Nevin. So he'll always be linked to that for me, unfortunately for him. Um, but look, like at the end of the day, um, he, he's never going to hit for a good average at the major league level. He's never going to be a power hitter. Uh, he had an expected slug and, you know, 365. That's really, really low. He doesn't barrel up balls. His sweet spot rate is really low. But the thing he has going for him is, is he walks he doesn't swing and miss too terribly often. He can be late on pitches, but he doesn't swing and miss a ton. And he doesn't expand the strike zone. He is very, very good at only swinging at pitches inside the strike zone. He just doesn't really do too much damage with those pitches. So he will find a job, a guy who plays multiple positions, uh, the corner infield, some corner outfit a little bit if needed. Uh, he, he will find work. Uh, if it is here, I'm very confident it's not going to be on the 40 man roster. I think he's another guy that kind of has a chance to be let go from the 40 man and then re signed as like a minor leaguer that's not on the 40 man roster, which is, you know, no harm to anybody. Sure, go for it. Whoever you want to do that with is fine. Um, that wouldn't shock me. But as far as him making it through the winter on the 40 man, I would be pretty surprised if he did so. Okay, cool. Let's have a little bit of a fun conversation here to end the show. Uh, There was a new baseball league that was started called Baseball United. Baseball United is, according to their X bio, Twitter, whatever you call it, uh, it is in uh, based in Dubai. And they recently had a draft. This was six days ago. They had a draft. It looks like they only have four teams. And it was a snake style draft and they went through and there's just some really, really fascinating names that came out of this. Uh, First and foremost, the number two overall pick was Steven Moya. He is going to play for the Monarchs this fall and winter. Um, It looks like this is going to be like end of November. They're like playing games. I, I, I don't have a schedule yet, but. I don't like I'm always just for more baseball. So uh, to be able to watch some of these like former major league baseball players is kind of cool. Kind of cool, excuse me. Um, but Steven Moya going number two overall in the draft. Raise your hand if you thought Steven Moya was going to be Barry Bonds. I know I did. Uh I was a either freshman or sophomore in high school. When Stephen Moya had his his short stints for the Detroit Tigers at the major league level, and I saw Stephen Moya when I was in middle school, I believe. Uh, down, I went with my mom down to see the Lakeland Flying Tigers one summer, and I saw this big, giant prospect for the Tigers in in right field, I believe. I have the scorecard somewhere um, from the game. 
uh, and because I, I just keep score at every game pretty much. And I, I remember being like, wow, this guy's huge. And then he hit a absolute bomb. And I was like, this guy's him. This this guy is absolutely going to be like he was Aaron Judge before Aaron Judge. This guy is going to hit 40 in a Tigers uniform and he's the future. Um, obviously, that did not <laughs> come to fruition. And I was all of probably 12 years old when I saw him in Lakeland. And then uh, I think like 14, maybe um, when uh, when he played for the Tigers. But yeah, I, I me and, and my <laughs> one of my best friend at the time, we we were very, very high on Stephen Moya. And so uh, I know that after his his major league career, he got sent down to the minors for a little bit. And then I believe he played in the NPB. I think he played for Japan. And then now he's playing in this league and was the number two overall pick. Shout out Stephen Moya, man. That's the dog right there. Uh, Didi Gregorius, third overall. Pablo Sandoval, um, the, the, him who shall not be spoken of. Uh, Pablo Sandoval ruined my childhood as well. Uh, Robinson Cano drafted. Phil Irvin. Antrelton Simmons. Jair Jurgens. Tigers legend Jair Jurgens. Um, who else? Robbie Ross. Bartolo Colon on the same team as... Uh, as Stephen Moya, Jeffrey Marte, Tigers legend, played uh, a few months in an old English D for the Tigers back in, I want to say 2017 or 2018. I might be a year off there, taken in the third hour by the Monarchs. Monarchs might just be our team, let me tell you. Um, Tigers legend Jacob Robson gets drafted by the Cobras. Robson was, he just played for the Tigers in like 2021, I want to say. Uh, he was. Uh, he was never like a top prospect, but he was, uh, he's Canadian, A, and uh, and B, he was uh, like, a, like a high walk guy that I kind of was fond of when he was coming up through the system as well. Just could never hit consistently enough uh, to really separate himself from the pack. So good to see him getting an opportunity. Who remembers Alejandro de Aza, a White Sox player that absolutely, I feel like he just massacred the Tigers, man back when he was with the White Sox. Um, Will and Rosario. Like, there's some fun – Hector Sanchez. There's some fun names here. Man. Rusny Castillo. Wow. Brandon Laird. Hernan Perez going to play for the Wolves. Get some Tigers fans uh, that will uh, that will be Wolves fans for Hernan Perez for sure. Um, Jeremy Profar. Carlos Martinez playing for the Monarchs as well. I'm kind of just listing names off at this point. I'm sorry if this isn't very good radio, but like this is like fun to me. Like just talking about like old names we forgot about. There's some, there really is some names here. That's funny. I think that's pretty much everybody that stood out to me. Yeah, Matt Soren. That's pretty much everybody. But um, just really fascinating stuff. And like the these guys having an opportunity to play you know, if, if they're retired, right, like the Robinson Canoes of the world, like those guys who are who are uh, their, their major league careers behind them to still continue to play baseball is really cool. And then honestly, like a lot of these leagues give an opportunity to uh, like some of the, the guys who are in their late 20s, even that are or like early 30s, maybe even in some cases that are trying to uh, to find, you know, a second wind in their career and kind of get back over to, to, to North America playing baseball somehow. So uh, we will, uh, we'll see how that product looks on the field, but some fun names there that I just thought was interesting. And I wanted to talk about a little bit. So thanks for making locked on tigers. Your first listen every single day. I appreciate y'all for tuning in as always. We will be back tomorrow doing some more deep dives, talking about any news that comes out of tigersville. I think that's it. Peace and love going to therapy's dope. I'll catch y'all tomorrow, baby. Go tigers.